morning. Thank you for joining us today for Sopera Las Fronteras, Transcend Borders, a discussion on spirituality and migration activism. My name is David Goodwin, and I am the Assistant Director at the Fordham University Center on Religion and Culture. Today's event is part of the Duffy Fellows Program. This program was founded in the memory of the late James Duffy, a longtime friend of the CRC and Fordham University. The Duffy Fellows Program funds the original research and writing of Fordham students and recent graduates exploring the intersection between religion and culture. Support from people like you makes all our programs possible. If you're interested in making a gift, I'll be sharing a link in a moment. Might spirituality, faith, religion motivate the work of migration activists? In order to answer this question, 2021 2022 Duffy Fellows, Madeline Hilt, and Afra Bundagi interviewed activists in New York City and at the Arizona Mexico border during a research trip in January 2022. Now, Allow me to introduce Madeline and Afra. Madeline Hilf is a graduating Fordham senior, full majoring in music and film, and minoring in Spanish. She is currently studying abroad at Pontificia, Universidad Católica, and Santiago, Chile. This summer, Madeline will serve as a full time volunteer at Kino Border Initiative, a migration justice advocacy organization in Nogales, Arizona in Nogales, Mexico. Afra Bondagi is a Fordham University junior from Long Island, and she is double majoring in philosophy and political science. Afra is an aspiring immigration attorney, and she hopes to make migration justice her life's work. Madeline Afra, all yours. Thank you, David, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and thank you all for coming. Um, before we begin, we would actually like to honor every victim of the horrific elementary school shooting in Uvalde, Texas, grocery store shooting in Buffalo, New York, and church shooting in Laguna Woods, California. Our hearts are with their families, and we will be holding a 30 second silence. We hope that you will join us. Thank you. So the purpose of this presentation is to showcase our research that we housed on the following website, which you can visit yourself at superalasfronteras.weebly.com, and we will definitely be sharing that link in the chat at the end. And we hope to get our own domain soon. So thank you, Maddie, for sharing the screen. This is our homepage, Supera Las Fronteras is the name of our project, and it translates from Spanish to transcend borders. We really like the language of transcendence as it has a spiritual connotation, and we feel that the message that Maddie and I are trying to put out into the world with projects that we have already worked on, this project and projects we hope to work on, is really just encapsulated, encapsulated in the command transcend borders. We hope that people will critically reflect on borders in general and what they as a concept represent and promote. So we want to first give some background information into how this project began. Maddie and I met virtually in January of 2020, or not January, but um, we met in sometime in 2020 when we were doing a global outreach project together. Um, Maddie was the team leader and I was a participant in that project. That virtual immersion was in partnership with the Kino Border Initiative who work with migrants on the Arizona-Mexico border. 
So from the start, issues of migration justice were pivotal to our friendship. So in spring 2021, we were approached by our mentor and Spanish professor, Dr. Carrie Caston, when we learned about the Duffy Fellowship offered by the Center on Religion and Culture at Fordham, and we were eager to apply to investigate issues of migration justice that we were both so passionate about. We also wanted to travel to the border to gather firsthand accounts from those working in or experiencing the situation. And our plan has evolved a lot since the origins, which we're going to get into in a moment. But our final manifestation turned out to be a look into if and how spirituality, faith, and or religion, all defined distinctly, appear within the lives and work of migration justice activists. We had the opportunity in January to travel to Arizona and Mexico for 10 days, and we interviewed people there as well as in our home base of New York City. I just wanted to show this homepage a little bit. Um, you can visit the site yourself. Uh, we'll put the link in the chat at the end of this webinar, but we have a welcome and kind of description of what we just went over. Some pictures, um, some bios, as well as our emails. If anybody is interested in getting in contact with us, feel free to reach out and some more photos. So with that, we can turn to our synthesis to describe our process and findings. So in the beginning, we actually wanted to interview migrants themselves about their experiences, but eventually we found ourselves focusing on those who work closely with and for migrants. So our research question is, how might spirituality, faith, and or religion motivate the work of migration activists if they play a role at all? We were able to gather a list of activists who we interviewed via Zoom and in person with the help of Professor Leo Cortado. And we quickly realized how interconnected the community is as we were given many recommendations for other potential interviewees on contact with our first batch. Most of our interviewees have been doing this work for decades and many are now retired and committed volunteers of migration justice organizations. We came up with a list of 17 interview questions which Maddie is showing you now, um, to open discussions surrounding the connections between an interviewee's faith, spirituality, and or religion, their migration activism work, personal anecdotes, and anything else that they found relevant to share. Each interview was different, so not every question, not every answer to every question appears in all of our videos. So one of the most fascinating observations that we found upon completing several interviews and getting to know the 15 people who we spoke with was how they each embody completely unique definitions of the words spirituality, faith, and religion. For instance, some of the activists are conventionally religious, including some religious leaders themselves, as well as spiritual in other ways. Uh, some of them noted their religion as one and the same with their spirituality, and others reject the concept of spirituality or faith or religion altogether. Many expressed their faith or spirituality as having a significant hand in motivating their work, an inextricable link with their decisions to get involved rooted directly in their belief system. But something common amongst everyone that we discovered was a strong sense of duty to the work, even separate from any presence of spirituality. We were also very curious about the sense of faith observed in migrants themselves from um, who our interviewees have interacted with. Uh, and they all described that it is generally a strong and unwavering presence and a quality that they really admire in those people that they have met. Just as much as people are motivated by their spirituality, faith, or religion, these motivators are also emboldened and sustained by their work. So it works in a cyclical and reciprocal fashion. Uh, we posed the question to everybody. One of our favorites was, what do you want people to know about the border? Giving them an opportunity to send a message to people who may not know um, what's happening or have the wrong idea. The general sentiment of this was the importance of educating oneself, being wary of misinformation that dehumanizes, and the necessity of compassion. Through everybody's personal reflections and anecdotes, it was truly revealed to us how diverse and varied the map of spiritualities regarding the field of migration activism is, specifically at the U.S.-Mexico border and specifically in the state of Arizona. Despite this diversity, activists are unified by a common purpose and felt obligation to alleviate suffering. And now we'll show you our interviews page where we have the recordings of 10 of our interviews that we completed. So as we mentioned before, we conducted interviews both in person and through Zoom. 
And our interviews were really just free flowing conversations. We wanted to hear everything our interviewees had to say. And we truly learned a lot hearing so many great pieces of information, insight, and advice. Maddie and I are really grateful to everyone who we were able to interview. And we're very happy with all the research we gathered. We invite you to, to watch our recorded interviews on this page. Um, and now we're going to show two clips just to give you a little taste of what is in our interviews. So our first clip that we have to show you is from our interview with Reverend John Fife. Afra and I actually attended a webinar discussion with him at Fordham last year when we were first developing this project and we really admired what he had to say and the work that he has done. So we were really excited about the opportunity to meet him in person in January. He is a key figure and trailblazer of the migration justice movement in the United States. He has helped to found Tucson Samaritans, No More Deaths in Humane Borders, all organizations in Arizona that provide aid to migrants in the desert, document statistics, and also advocate for policy change on a national level. Uh, so I will show this now. By profession. So, so I had to show up here <laughs> every Sunday morning <laughs> and talk about what did I think that moment in history uh, had to do with the whole history of our faith uh, and failure and sin and, and, uh, and help people understand uh, that, that very important question. What does the faith mean to us this week <laughs> given what's been going on around us given what the issues are that are before us given what we have done or failed to do uh, and how do we do it better for another week and, and that was my whole profession it was a it was a serious responsibility So we really appreciate what he has to say about the human spirit and how within our faiths and spiritualities, we must confront what is happening around us in the real world. These things are inextricable, inseparable, and we must consult our spiritualities to take action toward a more just system for everybody. And next we have an, uh, a clip of an interview to show you with Adama Ba, who was one of our most recent interviews via Zoom in March. Uh, she is truly a mover and a shaker in the words of Trina Yonkers Talls, who connected us with her. She's an activist in New York City working with several organizations, and she started this work after her own experience with the immigration system, learning that she was undocumented at age 16 when she was falsely accused of terrorism after 9-11 and wrongfully arrested. Since then, she has become a citizen and dedicated her life to making sure people do not have to go through the trauma that she went through. Her experiences and story have been the subject of her own book, Accused, My Story of Injustice, which came out last year in the 2011 documentary, Adama. That could be said, but I think one of the things is that we, we make it seem like as a, immigration is like a United States issue, but it's a worldwide pandemic issue right now. And because we have not addressed it and we, we feel that every human is illegal, it's, it's going to get worse. Um, you know, these borders and these lines and you can't come here, you can't get this. It's, it's getting worse and we have to address it. Um, and a lot, another thing is that a lot of these policies, the people who make them are not people who are affected by immigration. So someone who's never, I've been through, hell with immigration system, but they would never let me sit in at the table and make policy changes that make sense. Because then, I don't know, for them it's just that it doesn't, it doesn't help. But I feel like it would make a great impact if I was part of that table and that decision making, but I'm not welcome at that table. And that's what the world needs to know. In order to have positive change and success in our countries, People that are affected by those negative outcomes need to be at that table and they need to make those decisions. 
So I truly think that her words speak for themselves uh, in order to move forward and make positive changes. People directly impacted by these systems need to have a seat at that table. And we also often center the United States um, when thinking about these issues, but as Adama states, it is a worldwide um, phenomenon, migration. It's just a part of the human existence. So now we're going to move to untaped experiences, which were moments of our trip that we chose not to record. So there were certain experiences that we had in Arizona and Mexico that we felt would not be appropriate to film or record formally because we would lose the essence and authenticity of what was happening. And we wanted to just fully experience and be present in the moment without the distraction or formality of the camera. So instead we decided to just take notes and pictures to write full reflections later journal entry style. So this page shows our four untaped experiences written up. I wrote the first and the third while my, Maddie wrote the second and the fourth. So they are unique to both of us um, because though we were there and did the same things, we felt different things from those. The first reflection is about the Samaritan search we went on with Lori Jers and Barbara Lemon on day three of our trip. I wrote this reflection. And it was the first time that Maddie and I had ever seen the border wall along the Sasabe port of entry. Not only did we see it, we were also able to get out of our car and walk alongside it. And I won't give away too much so that you still read my reflection on the website, but I was really surprised because this day was a lesson for me in learning to let go of my own prejudice and biases. My first reflection is about Tuesday, January 4th, when Afra and I had the opportunity to cross the border by foot from Douglas, Arizona to Agua Prieta, Mexico, to meet with Hermana Maribel at Centro de Recursos para los Migrantes, or Migrant Resource Center in Agua Prieta, Mexico. Uh, being two women traveling alone, we were a little bit worried about crossing the border and expressed our concern the day before on the Samaritan search with Lori and Barb, asking, uh, how safe it is. And we were surprised at how they both said that it was really easy and um, fast, a fast process. Um, we weren't expecting that. So we headed to Douglas about two and a half hours from Tucson where we were staying. And when we got there, it was immediately a different feel. Uh, border towns are truly such spaces of precarity and limbo. Um, which is really interesting and emphasizes the fact that borders are just arbitrary lines drawn in the sand at the end of the day. Uh, it was really interesting to go into a store on the Arizona side and hear the workers speaking Spanish. Um, so we parked our car in a parking lot a five minute walk from the border and made our way under the big archway that said Mexico. We uh, were, it was very official and there were signs everywhere that said no cell phones and so we didn't want to do anything wrong and it seemed too good to be true that we were just walking on this sidewalk to the other side so we asked an officer um how we do it and he just said keep going he barely gave us a second glance um so we arrived on the other side to the organization which was right there right on the other side and we quick quickly found Hermana maribel uh she was having a busy morning at the center prepping for arrivals and we helped her uh, prepped the sandwiches and coffee for people who would arrive that morning, as well as cots um, for people who needed a place to stay that night. Uh, the center is in partnership with Frontera de Cristo, who we have another interviewee from, um, and they, the organization primarily serves Central American migrants who arrive via La Bestia, which is a freight train that a lot of people catch north if they can't afford another form of transportation, and often on this route they face unimaginable violence. Um, so at the center, they can receive basic first aid services, food, water, and even shelter if they come in the evening. Uh, we spoke to Hermana Maribel about her decision to dedicate her life to this work uh, in moments that reaffirm her own faith. And she really emphasized the importance of collaboration and accompaniment. Uh, vulnerable people in vulnerable situations need to know that they're not alone and that someone is there for them. And that's what she seeks to provide. Um, also, she wanted to honor the life of Andres, Facundo Marcial, who was a young man from Oaxaca, Mexico, who arrived about a year ago in June 2021. Uh, he came in in horrible condition with really dangerously dehydrated, and his condition was beyond the scope of her capacity as a nurse, so she sent him to a Red Cross. He returned thanking her for saving his life, but unfortunately that night he tragically died in his sleep after another health crisis, and 
She really wishes to honor his memory. Um, in the yard on the premises of the center, there is a cross placed to represent him. Um, and we have a photo of that in our photo gallery on this website. Um, the photo that is shown on the screen right now is also a photo from the center, which shows a beautiful mural, as you can see, shows a wall disintegrating and turning into butterflies flying away. Um, and Sister Maribel wanted to emphasize how every migrant's motivation matters and they deserve to realize their goals without suffering. On our way back over, um, crossing back into the U.S., it was very easy and fast. There were slightly more steps, like we had to have our passports checked and agents questioned us. Um, but all in all, it was entirely safe. And that juxtaposition really made me uncomfortable thinking about our privilege and how fast the process was where the migrants who we were standing alongside that very morning uh, were the same physical distance from the border as we were, but figuratively so much further. The third reflection is about the fifth day that we were in Tucson when we went on a hike at Arivaca Lake with John Hyde. And to call it a hike is a real understatement. It was a trek to get to the water drops that John was leading us to. There wasn't really a clear path and we were just fully walking up and down mountain. Um, while we were there, we cleaned up and replenished the water drops that aid groups have put on a known migrant trail for anyone passing through to take advantage of. And we didn't see anyone while we were there, but there were still clear signs of life with picked over jugs of water and rosaries hanging, hanging in the trees. Um, John also took us to see a small shrine that we have a picture of in our gallery. So we will be showing those all to you shortly. And all in all, this day and this experience was very moving as it helped us to learn about migration through walking a path that migrants themselves have walked and John had related this to us that same day that there are so many different ways to learn about migration, specifically as it pertains to the US-Mexico border. We could look at things from the side of the lawyers or the environment, but this was really our first time experiencing even 1% of what migrants go through to come to this country. My final reflection is about our hike with Lori Jers and Jennifer Clark behind their house on the Thursday of our trip. So we had planned to go to their house to interview Lori after having gone on the Samaritan search with her on Monday. It turned into much more of an experience we did not want to record. Uh, we were expecting just to walk to the sites behind her house that she described just in like a small backyard. And we quickly realized that their backyard is the vast expanse of desert. Um, so we visited many crosses that were set up in memory of people whose remains were found in that spot. Um, it was a project started by an activist named Alvaro Enciso, who is also a Tucson Samaritan. Um, he sets up crosses in honor of these migrants, and they each have a marker that they uh, that they show up in the GPS system, so they're all geolocated. Um, many of the crosses that we saw read desconocido, which means unknown or unidentified in Spanish, which means that these people, we don't know their stories, and they don't even have something as simple as a name uh, to be remembered by. One of them was desconocido adolescente, which means that it was a teenager, and it had sunglasses on the top of the cross. Um, we stood intentionally and presently with each of the lives that were taken far too soon, uh, taking in the haunting silence of the desert and feeling the immense loss of any life taken from our network of humanity. We read poetry and prayed, and um, one of the things we read was actually a passage found with the remains in that spot, another reminder of how much spirituality one possesses to persevere along this sometimes deadly journey. And after the hike, we were welcomed so graciously into the home of Lori and Jennifer, where we talked with them about their motivations and stories and backgrounds and how they don't get discouraged because they've been lifelong activists for decades. They had great advice for us and talked about how as long as people are suffering, there's not really a choice. We have to take on the responsibility um, because work needs to be done. And all we can keep doing is fighting for justice, no matter how sometimes paralyzing the lack of change or compassion from the government can feel. Uh, on our way home, we had a really special moment where we had to pull over to look at the stars because they were so bright, unlike anything we'd seen in our light polluted cities of home. Um, and Afra really expressed this moment more eloquently than I ever could in a poem that was published on the Center on Religion and Culture blog site, which we're gonna talk about now with our reflections page. 
So this page for now just houses a few pieces that we wrote regarding different moments of our trip that were published on the Center on Religion and Culture blog site. Um, we wrote these both during and immediately after our trip. We've included the links here and encourage anyone interested to read the pieces. Uffer wrote about her preconceived notions, which were challenged that she mentioned um, during her reflection about the Samaritan search. She also wrote a beautiful poem documenting how she felt during the moment that we fell in love with the desert, our sixth night of the trip after driving home from Lori and Jennifer's house. I wrote about our hike with John Hyde and the religious imagery so present in all the physical evidence that people had passed through that spot. Um, and I included my photos of the rosaries as well as the shrine that we had talked about. And I also wrote about selective memory and the question of who deserves mourning. Something that one of our interviewees, Gail Kusarek, said during her interview really stuck with me. Last year in the Sonoran Desert, there were 240 reported deaths. And that is the number of people who were found, not necessarily all of the people who died in the desert. Uh, the, if there were a plane crash with this many casualties, we would grieve everyone and know their names and publicly, loudly mourn their memory. But the deaths in the desert barely make a blip in the news. Um, they're deemed disposable and that's unacceptable and we have to ask ourselves why. Um, so I wrote about that and as we continue this work in this website, we're going to con uh, continue updating this page with more writing and art on the subject of migration justice, activism, spirituality, and how all of these topics relate to one another. Now we're going to get into our photo gallery we've been talking about so much. All right. So this is our photo gallery. And I just want to clarify that every picture that's on this website is a picture that we took while we were in Arizona and Mexico. And we took a lot. So we only compiled a few of our favorites onto this web page. I encourage you to go through all of them, but I want to go through some of them with you all to provide some context. First are some pictures of the border wall along the Sasabe port of entry. So this is where Lori and Barb took us on their Samaritan search. And you can actually really tell how tall the wall is there. You can see in relation to Barb and Maddie walking there and then the Samaritan van, but you still can't actually tell how much the wall towers over you. It's about 30 feet tall. And you can also see that the wall actually has gaps in it, um, which was surprising for me and Maddie to see as well. But there are cameras set up and barriers to prevent cars from driving over the border. So while the gaps might make it seem easier to cross, this is not the reality. And even if the migrants can make it over the border without being caught, it they face a long and dangerous journey afterwards to the nearest town or city. Our government actually plays on how difficult it is to cross the desert. The reason why there are so many deaths, deaths in the Sonoran Desert is because of a policy called prevention through deterrence that was introduced in the Clinton, during the Clinton administration. Through this policy, the government closed urban ports of entry so that migrants are forced to cross through hostile terrain. And the government thought that by making it difficult to cross, people would stop trying and stop coming. But this is an extremely privileged way of thinking that completely underestimates what people are willing to do for the well being and safety of their families and themselves. People are still going across, and people still are crossing. But now it's just more dangerous, which only exacerbates the amount of death in the desert. The next picture I'd like to share with you is the cross of Baby Arisaga. So I talked about this cross and this experience more in my reflection um, about the Samaritan search with Lori and Barb. Um, so this was the same day that we saw the, the wall along the Sasabe port, the Sasabe port of entry. So this is the cross of a baby boy who was born in, born and died in the desert. You can see that it is decorated with baby toys around them, um, around it, which baby Arisaga would never get the chance to play with. And he's actually named after um, his mother's last name, but that's about all we know about him. And we actually read a poem about how much we don't know anything about what happened. Um, and you can read it here. So this was the first cross that we saw. And there were many, many more throughout the rest of our trip. We do want to mention that we were hesitant at, er hesitant at first to even include pictures of the crosses as we didn't want to reduce people to an object nor exploit them for the sake of this presentation. 
they had lives and histories and we want to honor their lives with the utmost respect. And we did ultimately choose to include them though, because we felt that the best way to learn about the reality is seeing it. And we hope that we're able to convey the preventable death and suffering and violence that's occurring at our border. Next, we want to show you some pictures of the water drops that we visited with John Hyde. So the first picture is the first one that we went to, and it was a little bit smaller. We filled it up with new gallon jugs of water, snack packets and blankets, and we carried out the empty jugs. The next two pictures are pictures of the second water drop that we visited that was a little bit bigger. And we also wanna show a picture of the shrine that John took us to um, while we were on that same hike. It's very small and tucked away and actually very difficult to get to. Um, and you could walk right past it without even, and you can walk right past it without even knowing that, without even noticing that it was there. And we can see the religious imagery present. There's a cross. Um, there is a picture of the Virgin Mary. There are Mexican pesos, um, letters, pictures, photographs, clear signs that people were coming through this way. So next we have some of the crosses that we saw behind Lori Jers and Jennifer Clark's house. And we didn't actually include pictures of every single one of the crosses. Um, it was incredibly moving for us to see so many crosses in one place though. We wondered about who these people were, especially these crosses that to read desconocido, so a person who we don't know anything about. Um, we wondered who are they, who were they? And we mourned for them and their families. We also have a picture of a passage that was found with human remains west of Calle Uno. And it was one of the many things that we read while we stood in front of the crosses. I also want to show a quick picture of what the desert landscape actually looks like um, so that you have some context into why we keep saying it's so difficult to cross. So the desert is dry and the vegetation is brutal. During the day, the sun beats down and during the night, it gets painfully cold with nothing to trap that heat. And Maddie and I ourselves got stabbed here and there by random plants, but it was mildly uncomfortable at most. So I can only imagine what it's actually like to travel in the desert for days and in the darkness of night too, where you can't even see where you're placing your feet. So this is our moving forward page. Through our meaningful and rich conversations with these fantastic activists and getting to bear witness to some of the work that they do in some cases, we really learned so much and we're so grateful um, for our conversations with them. Since the beginning, this fellowship has really meant more to us than a temporary project. We really hope to continue having these conversations. And there is a burgeoning migration justice activism movement at Fordham. We hope it can continue and that this site can help to facilitate connections um, between migration justice activism organizations, migration justice activists, and Fordham University students and faculty. We want our website to be a place of conversation, an open and safe space to express and learn. And as one of our interviewees, Moyedin Abulaziz said, uh, we must ask ourselves the question, what are our priorities as people? Uh, we have to prioritize the prevention of death above all, um, because currently there is people are dying. Um, so we also have to, as a lot of our interviewees expressed, move past uh, Western individualist paradigms and more towards a model of community support and mutually based care um, in our increasingly connected world. Collaboration and partnership and solidarity are more important than ever. So we also wanted to talk about how we both wish to dedicate our lives to this kind of work in some capacity and wanted to share our next steps. This summer in August, we will both be full-time volunteers at Kino Border Initiative in Nogales, Sonora, Mexico. And through, with this site, we really hope to continue having these conversations and we'll update it accordingly. If you are at all interested, we encourage you to leave your email here 
and we will be in touch as we continue to add things and grow the site into something bigger. Hi, do you want to just scroll down to show people where they can, yep, so you can just leave your email right there and we will be sending emails. Okay, so we want to end our presentation with some acknowledgements. This project would not have been able to happen without the help of so many people and we're very grateful for all of their help. And we know that many of you are actually here today, so it's only right of us to shout you out. So we would like to thank the following people. David Goodwin, David Gibson, Dr. Carrie Caston, Dr. Leonel Guardado, Lori Jers, Barbara Lemon, Jennifer Clark, Eliseo Melendres, Hermana Maribel Lara Hernandez, Moyadin Abdulaziz, John Hyde, Carolina, Carolina Lopez, Reverend John Fife, Jack Knox, Linda Knox, Pastor Mark Adams, Rabbi Dr. Scott Solson, Trina Yonkers-Talls, Adam Abba, Gail Kusarek, and of course our friends and family. And with that, we can turn back to David. Thank you everyone for your attention and we look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you, Maddie and Apra for that wonderful and compelling presentation. Uh, I know that I learned a lot and that I was challenged and I imagine everyone watching us, I mean, watching you today uh, feels the same way. Uh, I just wanna let everyone uh, to have a minute to gather their thoughts and uh, present their questions to us. So for everyone watching, please share your thoughts and questions in the chat box. Uh, just a quick reminder to be respectful to our panelists and to your fellow guests. Um, I'm hoping that people that Maddie and Afra spoke with are joining us today and we're really hoping to hear from you and hear your questions. Uh, so I'll just start with a question of my own. Um, early, early in your presentation, Afra, uh, you mentioned that this research, especially this trip, it challenged your own ideas and preconceptions about migration and those involved in this work on, on one side or another. Um, I just, I'm just hoping the two of you can expound upon that a little bit. Sure, I can speak first. So, while we were there, um, I think it's very different to study an issue um, and have all these ideas about what what migration is like or what motivations people are going into this work with or any side of it. Um, and it can become very us versus them. And like I said, that is what it can feel like when you're just studying it, you know, reading and watching things. But when you're actually there and you're actually speaking to people, you realize quickly, or at least I realized quickly that I had underestimated the humanity of everybody who was involved in the situation. And that includes border patrol officers. So I definitely came in with this like, kind of stern face of, I'm not gonna talk to them, I'm not gonna say anything nice. But um, then when we were actually there and we talked to border patrol officers and we talked to um, people who seemed like militia groups, we talked to people who are have different views than us on the border. And I just really realized that they are not the monsters I'd made them out to be in my head. So that Samaritan search that we did with Lori and Barb while it was my first time seeing the border walls, also like my first time really like opening my eyes to every part of the border and the border wall and everybody who's involved in any part of the migration process. Maddie, do you wanna to add to anything? But I totally wanna to echo everything that Afra said. Um, I think that this trip and being around um, the border and learning about these issues straight from um, these activists really taught me to not have expectations at all um, because going in expecting anything will is just going to lead to a lesson that because um, because there's really nothing that we can expect um, and we were able to just experience a lot of things that we hadn't experienced before um, so Yes, I agree that on the Samaritan search, that was our first taste of it because it was our first day and our first experience. Um, but throughout the trip, the trip, I kept um, having my perceptions challenged. Um, so it was a great lesson in that. Interesting. So we have a great question here about the 
the design of your website. So very practical, very technical question, um, an aesthetic question. Um, can you talk about some of the aesthetic decisions and putting together the website and the videos? For example, uh, I noticed that the video of Reverend Fife um, was framed within uh, with cacti in a picturesque adobe wall. Was this intentional? Um, what decisions did you make as you designed the website? So thinking of images, videos, did you fashion it in the way that you were hoping to have a certain effect upon the viewer? I can talk about in terms of the framing of the videos, we honestly didn't plan anything. It was just where um, they wanted to hold the interview and we just set up the camera wherever the interviewees chose to sit. Um, so that did end up kind of working well um, because Southside Presbyterian Church where we met Reverend Fife um, was a really interesting space. And he told us a lot about the architecture um, and how it's kind of centered around less European architecture as most churches are um, and more Native American traditions. Um, so the adobe wall and I guess the cacti outside really contributed to the desert feel of really the setting where we were. Um, in terms of the website, we wanted it to feel, we chose colors intentionally for sure um, because we kind of wanted it to be earthy and like what, what the desert reminded us of basically. Um, in terms of the pictures too, I think it was just really spur of the moment when we were experiencing moments, we snapped pictures and then we um, chose our favorites to include, but it wasn't super intentional other than wanting to convey the feeling of the desert um, in the color choices. Alfred, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think you put it really great, um, Maddie. Um, just in terms of the design of the website, we were really just more interested in conveying the general feel um, than more like meticulous, like details or like placing and stuff like that. Um, but our research was, even though we did choose to house our research on a website, so it was important to us, like what the website looked like, it was more important to us to just convey the research and what we learned. So we have another question about the website. Um, how are you hoping the Fordham University community or an outside community might engage with this website going forward? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so since, like Maddie said in our presentation, from the beginning, this project has meant more to us than just a temporary research project that we would just put on a website and it would gather dust over the years. We want it to become something more comprehensive and we want it to be a space of conversation and a place for people to really just express what they're feeling about migration. And that can be on so many different levels and so many different fronts. We are really hoping to open it up to the Fordham community or any community, um, faculty, staff, people we don't know. We'd love to get submissions of people's writings, poems, photographs, personal memoirs, like anything that people really wanna say. Um, we'd re really love to house that on this website as well. Um, the whole thing is gonna have to be revamped for sure once that happens and we get it off the ground, but we really want this to be a place of expression. So that's how we really plan to grow our website is just give more people a space to have a voice. So uh, oh, here's a really great question. Um, so earlier in the presentation, you spoke about disinformation, um, hyperbole, sensationalism around this issue. How might that be overcome or challenged? I can go first on this one. So I think the best thing to do is to, like Maddie said earlier, not come in with any expectations and then also just speak directly to the people who are involved in the situation. People can posit all, we, me and Maddie can posit all types of things about migrants or border patrol or people that we're not, um, anyone can do that about anyone, but it really, 
where you're well, where you'll find the real information and the real truth and the real opinions of people is when you just go and talk to them. So I know that it's not that easy to just go to the border. So we're not saying, we hope you will all do that, but we're not saying that that's what's necessary. But I think the most important thing in terms of misinformation is to listen to multiple sides and get the information straight from the source, not here and there and listening to people report on what they think were the motivations behind an action. Completely agreed. I think that was perfectly said, Afra. Um, and I would just add to just read as much as possible and don't be distant from the issue, even if you are physically distant. Um, again, there are opportunities to listen to and read um, and even talk to people directly experiencing the situation and the injustice. Oh, so here's another question. And you might have touched upon this in the presentation, but I mean, what's next? for this larger project outside the website? Are you hoping to visit the border again? No, absolutely. We um, are actually going back. It was funny because while we were there, while, me, while Maddie and I were there um, in Tucson, on like the third night, we were already talking about how to come back after our, our trip had ended because we were only there for 10 days and we wanted to be there for much longer. So thankfully, we have the opportunity through Fordham again to go to Nogales, um, Mexico, and we're going to be working with the Kino Border Initiative, as we mentioned earlier. So we will be going back to the border, and this time it's not going to be research-based. We're not really going in to try to gather information. We're just going to learn from people in whatever experiences we have volunteering there. Um, but yeah, Maddie mentioned earlier too during the presentation that both of us hope to dedicate our lives to migration justice in some capacity. Um, so this is really just one thing in our long journey, we feel. Yes, couldn't have said it better myself. We've also talked about in the past um, wanting to visit other states on the border. Um, we don't have any concrete plans to do that, but. Uh, we hope to be able to in the future. And I wanted to say again, with this experience volunteering at Kino this summer, um, from this experience of this project, I'm really gonna go in with no expectations. I mean, with the expectations needed for heavy work like this to, in order to not get burnt out, um, that's important. And that's something we've also talked about with these activists, um, but without expecting anything, um, because I'm just, I just, we just have to be open to learning and experiencing. So Maddie, you just mentioned burned out, burnout. And one question that came to me uh, as I was listening to your presentation, and especially as I was watching the clips of the interviews uh, with some of the participants in this was how, um, excuse me, how might the faith or the religion or the spirituality of your sources sustain them? I mean, did they, did they ever mention to you that that's what kept them going forward when in some ways this work seems so grueling, thankless, ceaseless? <laughs> yes, a lot of people did mention um, that they honestly don't know how one can be involved in this work without having a sense of spirituality, something to motivate them. And often that, that thing is just the need for justice and um, and a few people even expressed not having a spirituality at all, but just an obligation um, to this work. Like if someone is not free, I'm not free. And um, we're all not free until everyone is free. So <laughs> sentiments like that, um, that it is, we definitely asked a lot of people though, because um, it can be easy to get discouraged when you see a lack of action um, or change and people continuing to suffer. But that's exactly what kept a lot of people going is that there are people suffering. So we have to take the responsibility um, to alleviate that in any way that we can. And I just wanted to add, Maddie and I were super starstruck and like just amazed by everyone we talked to and for both of us, we were trying to learn as much as we could personally 
from the people that we interviewed. And I think the thing that we wanted the answer to the most was like, how do you not get burnt out? Um, because I mean, both of us ourselves, we've only been doing this work for like a couple of years and we're already like, you know, getting tired. <laughs> um, but it was, everyone had really just great things to say. And I feel like the thing that really sustains people is collaboration. And that's a type of spirituality as well, going to groups and meetings and doing Samaritan searches together. They never do them alone. They always have a partner with them. So I think that was also something that was expressed in our interviews is the, ne the necessity of collaboration in order to enact any change and also sustain your solidarity. Definitely. I just wanted to add, because that reminded me, yes, yeah, so many of our interviewees express that sentiment of not being able to do it alone. And that's also um, what encourages them because there are so many organizations and so many partnerships that they form. And that's the most important thing. Um, is collaboration. Uh, so I'm going to take uh, one final question from our audience. Uh, in the presentation, you made it clear that this is not a new problem. You mentioned uh, policies created during the Clinton administration. So that is now, geez, almost 30 years ago. <laughs> um, and the public, whatever side they might fall on, it's, we seem very polarized, opinions seem very firm, very concrete. Talking with everyone um, over the past year, whether it was at the border or New York City, did you get any sense of hope that there might be a way to move forward on this issue in a positive way? That's a tough question. <laughs> I, think, I think we always have to have hope. Um, I think that was, the general sentiment that we got from our interviewees as well is, actually I remember one thing that Moyadina Abdulaziz said in his, um, his was more like, we were just having a really conversation. It wasn't very much of a formal interview with our questions, but he talked about um, how hope is not actually as important as people think it is. Um, I mean, yeah, definitely it's important, but also people don't need hope. People need food, water, shelter. Um, so sometimes leaning into that can sustain and help you to keep moving forward. But I think the, I mean, I'm reading the exact question from David Gibson. Do you have any hope for movement in attitudes that could move us forward? Yeah, I do have hope. I do too. There, as you mentioned, Afra, is just an urgency to it. Um, but to keep the momentum going um, and to just use our imaginations to see a future where people can thrive and realize their full right to flourish. Um, you have to be motivated by that, that sense of, um, of belief that that can be possible in our world. Yeah, I agree. I just wanted to add like a sense of imagination is incredibly important to any type of social justice work. You have to be able to imagine a different world, which is already so difficult, but I feel like that's the first step. You have to just I'd think that there's changes possible for any change to even occur. That's a wonderful thought. Uh, so we're nearing the, the end of our time together. I have one final question for you. Um, would you share with the audience your thoughts on being Duffy Fellows over the past year? Sure, I can go first. So <laughs> this was a really great opportunity for both Maddie and I. We're so grateful. It was kind of a roller coaster that we applied in. We found out about it a week before the deadline. Professor Kasten reached out. She was like, you guys, you got to do this. And then we were like, yeah, we got to do this. So we're really thankful that we were able to have this opportunity for them and the CRC has supported us through the entire thing, um, financially, um, emotionally. So it's been a really great pleasure to work on this fellowship and yeah, great experience. I agree. I've been so honored to have learned so much from doing this project and been able to complete work that I really, really care about. Um, and I'm so grateful for the CRC support on that. I'm about to graduate in August. So um, it was wonderful to kind of close out my Fordham experience with this and 
with like not with a period at the end like we're going to continue and still be connected with Fordham and continue our site and everything um but it was the folks at CRC were always available willing to support us help us brainstorm a lot of times we had a few crises with just like what we were even going to do what our research question was and it was always um a really supportive network so um we had a great experience thank you and it was honor and pleasure working with the two of you as well um any final thoughts for our audience yes we have a couple um so oh maddie before we wrap up we just we have a few parting thoughts for you and just want to say that this conversation is ongoing and huge and um, we were only able to scratch the surface so this is by no means comprehensive we also wanted to leave you with some statistics according to the international organization for migration 650 deaths were recorded borderwide in 2021 alone which was a new record over 200 of these deaths occurred in arizona according to humane borders in the pima county medical examiner's office our migration policy in the united states actively operates against people's basic human rights um, to basic safety and protection. Um, a lot of the quote unquote instability leading to a necessity to migrate also is caused directly by United States intervention as well. So despite all attempts to curb migration using deterrence measures as Alfred talked about before, migration will continue to happen, making it unsafe will only lead to more death and pain. We also want to say that Title 42 was just renewed. It started during the Trump administration at the start of the pandemic to use COVID as an excuse not to grant people asylum. As the United States has essentially declared COVID over by now, we find it outrageous that suddenly it's a concern when it comes to providing safety to people asking for it. It was just renewed the other day. There are no masking or safety measures in place in any area of the US. So to cite that as a concern is clearly covering up xenophobia under the guise of public health safety. Um, why are we prioritizing certain lives over others? We really don't need to look any further. Then recent events in Ukraine and the resulting refugee crisis to illustrate the point that certain lives are valued more. The world was able to and eagerly did absorb millions of Ukrainian refugees, as they should have, but we have to ask why we don't absorb migrants waiting for asylum who sleep in cemeteries of the US-Mexico border in the same way. There was a famous photo circulating this past September of Border Patrol agents literally whipping Haitian immigrants um, on horseback. And the white supremacy and imperialism inherent in these actions needs to be confronted by all of us and firmly rejected. So I'll try to speed this up, but moving forward, we want to just provide a couple of things that people here can use to educate themselves. So there are a couple of resources for books we would like to re recommend The Life and Death of Ada, Ada Hernandez by Aaron Bob Rostrain, The Line Becomes and The Line Becomes a River by Francisco Cantu. And in terms of media, I'd like to recommend the documentary Immigration Nation and the movies I'm No Longer Here, The Infiltrators, and La Jaura del Oro. The No More Deaths website also has a section called Abuse Documentation, which is great for tangible stats. And there's chances, chances are that there's an organization near you with opportunities to volunteer if you're interested in doing hands-on work. We know that was a lot of information, but our emails are on the website and also we have that little section that you can put your email into. So thank you everyone for coming. And I see the chat. We can definitely add a page for resource recommendations to our website. So I know that was really quickly, but yeah, thank you everyone for coming and enjoy the rest of your days. Thank you so much everyone for coming. We really, really appreciate your attention. I'd like to thank Maddie and Afro for a wonderful conversation today and for everyone who shared their morning with us. We'll be posting this to our YouTube channel in the coming days, so stay tuned for that. Our next and final Duffy Fellows event for 2022 will be Instagram Ethics, Catholic Social Teaching and Social Media Activism with current Duffy Fellow and newly minted Fordham grad, Samantha Scalafani, on Wednesday, June 29th at 12 p.m. on Zoom. We hope that you can join us. Take care, everyone, and have a wonderful Memorial Day weekend.